Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Today I'm going to make a hammer from scratch. I'm starting with a two inch round by about four and five eighths long piece of 1045 carbon steel. This is a medium carbon steel and it will provide an appropriate level of hardness for this hammer but retain a good amount of toughness which is necessary for a repeated impact that a hammer of course will experience. I've made or forged quite a few hammers in the past, but I've never, I was never able to really refine my process. I was getting the product I wanted, but not in the time uh, allowance that I really needed to. It was very time consuming and should not have been that time consuming, but I really, it's hard to make, uh, it's hard to make money when you take too long to build a product. So, I haven't built any hammers in a while, but this particular one is designed or intended to help me refine my process here. I've thought, given some more thought to it. I've also forged quite a few axes in the meantime, and while they're, they're a different tool, there are some similarities with the punching and the drifting of the eye. So I'm taking my, my uh, conglomeration of experience here and in, in trying to uh, do this in a, a more time uh, effective fashion where I can make and sell these and uh, not feel like I'm, uh, you know, making something that's really not helping helping me do my, my job, which is provide for my family. So that's what I'm doing here. And I also needed a, another hammer for my shop. I've got a couple of hammers, but I don't, I don't, uh, I don't have what I need here. All, all across the board. I need some lighter hammers in the shop. And this one, I'll tell you right now, came out right at three and three quarter pound, which is where I was shooting for. I think this billet was around four pounds. I don't remember exactly, but the amount that you lose during forging is uh, fairly significant. You have to take that into account for your finished product. I have to forge the length of this billet down. Obviously the dimensions are not right for the hammer that I'm making. And the hammers that I make are a really blocky, I I, uh, I think it kind of looks what you, like what you might consider to be sort of a Viking or Norse or just old European style hammer. In fact, some engravings or art artwork from the Middle Ages or, you know, ancient times, you see hammers that are more or less sort of a... Uh, almost crude looking block and it's it's sort of a very uh, brute looking hammer just like what am I trying to say it's a tough looking hammer it's a uh, very serviceable basic but we're, we're gonna do this and make it look good there's something about having a nice forge finish across the uh, whole surface so I've got my billet forged to the dimensions that I want it, and now I'm starting to punch the eye. This is really important, and I'm trying to make sure that it's lined up lengthwise and widthwise, and running straight with the uh, billet here. You can, and you'll see me uh, in a minute here, you can adjust the eye as you're working on it, and you should as quickly as possible if there's any little... Uh, errors or variations but we're trying to get it as perfect as possible to avoid any little issues as we go rather than having to fix stuff down the road punching both sides here on the same heat that's definitely not a problem with a big billet like this retaining all that heat from the forge i should have put another application of uh, beeswax and graphite that's my uh forge lube there, my punch lube. I should have put another application on there. But the uh, the plug came out pretty easily and we have a nice punched eye here in this hammer. The next step is to drift the eye. Obviously it's much too small at this point and it needs to be much larger and rounded. So I have a series of drifts that will open this eye up and 
get it to the appropriate dimensions. As this is happening, of course, we're also forging the cheeks of the hammer on either side of the eye, and that's part of the whole process. Everything we're doing is going to contribute to the finished uh, dimensions and look or form of this hammer. I've got my punch or my drift uh, forged in there and to release it I'll just forge down on the cheeks and then lightly lengthwise and usually it comes right out. It goes right into the slack tub or the uh, quench tank to cool it off for the uh, other side. Onto the next drift, the next one up here after completing both sides with the first drift size. Same process here and just trying to make sure everything is straight as we're drifting this. We don't want that cockeyed in either direction because that's going to affect the finished orientation or indexing of the eye and that's something we want to be careful with. At this point I'm noticing the eye is slightly cockeyed and I'm going to push the side that needs to go back center, I'm going to push that down here with a block that uh, isolates the pressure from the forging press and allows me to move that eye back into alignment. This is our last drift in the press, very close to finished dimensions. So the type of ham types of hammers that I forge have very thick cheeks and uh, short distance between the face and the axis or the center of the handle. This is for ergonomics that allow you to extend your arm in, in a manner that's uh, fully, fully extended when you're contacting the surface of the anvil provided that your anvil is set to the proper height, which should be the surface of your knuckles if you stand straight up in good posture with a fist and your arm or hand relaxed down at your side. So this drift was a little stubborn. I, I drifted both sides here without cooling the, the drift off and it's, it's uh, warmed up a little bit so it's kind of stuck just a tad. I was able to tap it on the ground and it came right out after working it in the press like this. I'm seeing that the eye is a little bit off and still and so we need to address that before we move on. My billet was not completely even from the beginning. I could have spent a little more time on that and that would have helped here but this is fairly easy to correct at this point because it's minor and so we're not trying to move that eye around a whole bunch just slight adjustments so it's looking pretty good and we're about ready for the final drift which is going to bring the eye up to the final size and the hammer will be uh, getting close to being done with the forging process using a hammer to make a hammer. So how do you make the first hammer? Which came first, the hammer or the... Okay, anyway, so just gonna drive this in to where we're right up to the top of the drift. That's our largest dimension on there and free up the drift the same way we did every other time. And then flip the hammer around and repeat the process on the other side. This will give us a slight hourglass shape to the inside dimensions of the eye which of course is important for fitting the handle and wedging it up so that there's a strong and uh, durable fit up.
and is that the right way to say it? So it's not going to come off. Final heat for for uh, normalizing, and I'm just going to check the check how the drift is sitting in the in the hammer there because that's how the hammer handle is going to fit up with the head, and I want to make sure everything is straight on all points here, and that'll save us a headache down the road if we get to the uh, fit up process with the handle and find that it's not lined up properly but everything looks good we can let it cool down and then we will quench it and harden this steel it's necessary to use water to quench this steel and even then you're not going to get full hardness all the way through this block of steel but that's okay because we need the faces of the hammer to be hard and if the interior is a little less hard that just adds to the overall toughness which keeps the steel from just cracking but that's why you use a medium carbon steel like 1045 it's a it's necessary to agitate it vigorously to break the vapor jacket that forms when you put red hot or orange hot steel into water once it cools down to a certain point, then you can continue cooling it and the uh, vapor jacket will no longer form. It's steam, you know, it insulates the steel, slows the cooling process, not good. So here we have our quenched hammerhead and we're ready to temper it for two hours. And we can move on to the final stages of this hammer build. I'm using the drift again to make sure that I'm grinding the faces of the hammer in alignment or indexed with the with the eye as it actually sits on the drift because you can look at the eye and it should be very close but the way the drift actually sits in the hammer is going to tell you the closest uh, how how it's actually fitting how the hammer handle is actually going to fit in that hammer head. You don't want a dead flat hammer face, of course. Uh, there's multiple reasons, but one of them being you can't hit dead flat and you don't want to hit dead flat when you're hammering. Sharp corners are not very strong and a bit of a radius is very useful for all kinds of forging. So the flat, quote unquote, flat side of the hammer has a slight radius to it. And then the other side, we're going to grind a little more aggressively and make that the rounding side of the hammer, which will allow us to even more aggressively move material under the hammer and do different things. Finishing it up on a 220 grit, worn out 220 grit belt, brings it up to a decent working finish and you can go above that but next I'm going to wire brush the surface of the hammer, bring out that nice forged finish, get all the forged scale off. I'm using a nice piece of hickory for the handle here. I put shorter handles on my hammers to match with the ergonomics. I don't uh, typically grip my hammer way out on the handle and uh, just just the way that I like to do it it kind of goes along with some ideas from the Yuri Hofi I think hammer hammer style but I've used it a lot and uh, works pretty well so the handle went right on things went together pretty quickly here on this one kind of nice Hammer's got some good uh, life to it, pretty, pretty lively. Now I can shape the handle and get it ready to install on the hammer head. got my makeshift dust collection system there it it helps it doesn't get everything but 
get this hammer handle smoothed out and something that uh, will give you a good secure grip something that's not uh, too hard to hold on to you don't want something that's too too skinny it's just your your hand has to work too hard to hold on to to it and then I really like that flare at the end that just helps with additional grip retention on your hammer sawn in the kerf for the wedge and I've got a piece of ash here for the wedge shape that on the sander on the grinder here and get it ready to go Doing some final sanding on the handle before installing it. It's just easier to do when there's not a hammerhead on there. Make sure everything's indexed the way we fit it up originally. And I'll just seat it right down to where it was before. And then we can put the wedge in. I like to use waterproof tight bond wood glue on my wedges, it's good stuff. Make sure that never comes out until the handle someday breaks. Yeah, handles do break if you use it, use the tool enough. It takes a long time depending on what you're doing, but eventually, someday this will have to be re-handled. Really nice wedge up there. You want it slightly oversized and the ends of it will scrape off on the eye as necessary and get a really tight, nice fit there. Got some linseed, boiled linseed oil on the handle here and this thing turned out pretty nice. If you want to see me using this, stay tuned for future videos because I will be using this to forge blades and stuff. And if you're interested in getting your own, your very own Fire Creek Forge forging hammer, go to my website and get on my email list on the front page there. I am planning on forging some for sale here in the near future. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next video.